Well, here we are, chapter 18, electrochemistry, finally up to our final chapter of the uh, year. And uh, this is all about electrochemistry. So a lot of our talk is going to be about batteries and what is the, um, the chemical um, nature of a battery. Uh, this uh, goes right after um, the talk about thermodynamic favorability. Batteries use chemical reactions that have thermodynamic favorability in order to produce electricity. The type of reactions we will be talking about in this chapter are going to be redox reactions because redox reactions involve a transfer of electrons. So electrochemistry is the study of the interchange of chemical and electrical energy. So we use the chemical free energy of a reaction to produce electrical energy. This is the type of um, chemistry that is used to produce batteries. Batteries that start your car, batteries that run your cell phone, your calculator, your battery powered radio, even your flashlight. These are all chemical reactions that produce electricity. So how do you take a redox reaction and generate an electric current. You need to design a galvanic cell. So we call these galvanic cells. These are um, chemical um, setups that produce electric current from uh, redox reactions. For example, the redox reaction 8H plus plus permanganate plus 5 iron 2 plus makes Mn plus 2 and 5 iron 3 plus and 4 liquid waters is a reaction that you could design into a, a battery or a galvanic cell. Now the trick is to not run the reaction in one container. You want to run the reduction half reaction in one container and the oxidation half reaction in the other. And if you do that, but connect the electrodes in the two containers with wire, you can actually get the electron that's transferred from one uh, chemical species to another to have to pass through the wire. And as it lowers its uh, potential energy passing through the wire, that potential energy drop can be harnessed to light a light bulb, to spin a fan, to do a variety of things that a battery can do. So the reduction half reaction is the addition of five electrons. Remember, uh, gaining electrons is reduction. Um, eight H plus and a permanganate and five electrons make manganese two plus and four waters. This is not only balanced by atoms, it's balanced by charge. The oxidation reaction would be the iron plus 2 turning into the iron plus 3. This reaction would have to be multiplied by 5 because um, you want to get 5 electrons produced for every 5 electrons used up. So these are the two half reactions that add up to the reaction above. Now if you put these reactions in the same solution, you would just get the transfer of electrons between the uh, between the ions. But you want to make sure that the electrons have to flow through the wire to get to the other half reaction. And so you separate the two react half reactions in separate beakers. So on the side that the diagram is labeling the anode, you're going to get the Fe plus 2 being oxidized to produce Fe plus 3. So we have the Fe plus 2 that's in the um, solution on the left in the left beaker. It's going to turn into Fe plus 3. It's going to convert to Fe plus 3. And the electron is going to move through the anode, the iron solid anode, through the wire to the light bulb. Uh, a, a turn on the light bulb and then it's going to finish the circuit by moving over to the cathode. Now in this case the reduction side is the cathode. We do not have anything on the reduction side that is a, um, a suitable electrode. We don't have anything over here that we could actually use as an electrode. Everything is ions on the reduction side or liquid water. 
So instead, we take a chemically inert metal like platinum, which um, is not going to be reactive in the acid with the acid or the permanganate or anything on the right side beaker. And we use the, uh, the platinum as our electrode. So on the right side, we have the reduction reaction occurring as electrons are gained on the right side. Lost on the left side, oxidation gained on the right side, reduction. So all it takes is connecting with the, uh, the wire to get the uh, electrons to flow from the uh, oxidation side to the reduction side. Now, um, if we uh, think about these electrons flowing, the negative charge would tend to build up on the right side as the electrons are flowing, which would then resist electrons continuing to flow to the right. So in order to maintain this steady flow of electrons, we need the salt bridge. The salt bridge contains ions, maybe uh, sodium and chloride or potassium and nitrate in this particular example. A salt bridge is going to be a high concentration of K plus and NO3 minus. Now it's going to have uh, like a, a cotton plug on um, the bottom of this U-shaped uh, salt bridge um, on each side, but it will allow the movement of ions into the beakers that need um, ions to flow for charge balance. So if you're losing electrons from the left beaker, you would have nitrate ions flow in to the left beaker. If you're gaining electrons on the right beaker side to balance that negative charge, you would have um, uh, positive potassium ions migrating into the right beaker. So the salt bridge is important because truly without the salt bridge, you do not complete the entire circuit. You're moving electrons from left to right, but they need to come back um, at least the amount of charge needs to come back to the left side so that we don't have um, a buildup of electricity or electric charge on one side or the other. So our vocabulary is that that U-shaped tube that's upside down between the two um, beakers is called the salt bridge. So it's bridging the two beakers and it has some kind of ionic salt um, at a high concentration in there. Uh, you can also use something called a porous disc uh, that allows ions to flow through, although not easily. You, you don't want just um, ions flowing easily and mixing between the two sides. You want it to be controlled flow of ions just to maintain the electrical neutrality on each side, um, but to allow some negative ions to flow into the side that is losing electrons and some positive ions to flow into the side that is gaining electrons. So the entire device is called a galvanic cell and it changes chemical energy to electrical energy. The electrode where the oxidation occurs is called the anode and the electrode where reduction occurs is called the cathode. So one way of remembering this is just to, this picture on the right. So just imagine a picture of an ox, because ox starts with a vowel, you have to say an ox, anode, oxidation, and a picture of a red cat, reduction, cathode. An ox, anode, oxidation, red cat, reduction, cathode. Now, you're going to get a voltage between the two compartments. Every battery has a voltage. Every galvanic cell has a voltage that's associated with it. And this voltage is called the cell potential. So the electrochemical cell potential is called the voltage, is the name we give to the voltage between the two compartments. Uh, it can be called the electromotive force that is forcing the electrons to move from one side to the other or given the symbol E subscript cell. So the symbol for cell potential is capital E. Um, sometimes it's kind of a scripted capital E. And um, the subscript cell means that it is the um, uh, cell potential. 
So to give you some units here, a volt is a joule per coulomb. Coulomb is a measure of charge. Think of uh, Coulomb's law and how it talks about charge. Coulomb is a uh, is a, um, a a unit for charge. And um, you might have remembered way way back talking about the um, number of coulombs in an electron when Millikan measured the uh, charge of an electron. He found it to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So a volt is a joule per coulomb. So in other words, if a coulomb of electrons move from one side of a um, circuit to the other and there is a one volt drop or one volt um, potential between the two sides, if those electrons drop a one volt in um, potential as they go from one side to the other, that coulomb of electrons dropping one volt would be capable of doing a joule of work if you had a perfect um, machine. So one joule of work per one coulomb equals one volt. Uh, you can hook up a voltmeter to this to measure the voltage and um, it would give you a, um, a number and that number would be the cell potential. Uh, notice that the electrons are going to flow from the anode to the cathode because oxidation occurs at the anode. Oxidation is losing electrons. Reduction occurs at the cathode. Cathodes um, are um, where uh, reduction occurs. Reduction is gaining electrons. So the left side is losing electrons. The right side is gaining electrons. But there is going to be ion flow between the two sides in order to maintain um, electrical neutrality on both sides and complete the circuit. So chemists have a system. Um, as you know, uh, thinking back to thermodynamics and a lot of the things we've done, uh, the chemists come up with these tables of information that can be used to interpret and uh, predict uh, the results of certain reactions. And um, for these redox reactions that generate these voltages in these um, galvanic cells, chemists do have a system for generating these voltages. So the way they um, generate the table that is going to give you the uh, values um, is that they're going to have values for each half cell. So just one half of an, of an electrochemical galvanic cell is going to have a value, a voltage, assigned to it. And um, it's going to be based on a standard. So this is a relative scale. It's going to be based on a standard that's going to be given a value of zero. So similar to the, um, the way we do with enthalpies of formation and Gibbs free energies of formation and also with um, the Celsius scale, in a similar way, we have a, an assigned zero and then numbers are going to be given to other half cells. I'm calling uh, one half of this the half cell. Um, other half cells are going to be positive or negative depending on where they line up with that standard cell. So the standard cell that is agreed upon among chemists is called the standard hydrogen electrode. So it is a reaction where H plus turns into H2 gas. So these are done from, this, from the reduction potential point of view. So as you know, um, um, oxidation reduction reactions can be either oxidation or reduction. So these are the reduction uh, potentials. And um, for, um, for the standard hydrogen electrode, uh, you would have one molar H plus, and it would be um, in uh, uh, contact with um, um, a platinum electrode uh, because H plus and H2 do not make suitable solid electrodes. So you'd have a platinum electrode in the standard hydrogen electrode. And then the H plus would be one molar and the hydrogen gas would be one atmosphere. All the ionic solutions are one molar. All the pressures of gases are one atmosphere and the temperature is 25 Celsius so that we can consider it thermodynamically to be at standard conditions. Now, um, to test the uh, standard um, 
electrode potential or standard reduction potential of another half cell, you would simply pair it with the standard hydrogen electrode and measure the voltage. Now in this particular case, we are testing a standard, um, we're testing a zinc electrode to see what its standard reduction potential is. So zinc is actually in this particular reaction found to not be reduced but rather to be oxidized. The zinc is being oxidized from zinc to zinc plus two, giving up two electro electrons. Those are flowing over to the other side where the two electrons are being used to combine with two H pluses to make H2 gas. Now the overall reaction, the overall redux, um, redox reaction is gonna be zinc plus two H plus, yield zinc plus two plus H2. Um, now, since electrons are actually flowing away from the zinc, instead of uh, from, from away from the zinc in over to the hydrogen side, we are observing here that hydrogen prefers, hydrogen ions prefer to be reduced over zinc plus two ions. So we have a choice here. We could be turning zinc plus two into zinc, or we can be turning H plus into H2. The thermodynamically favorable direction, um, according to um, what we see here with the electrons flowing from the zinc side to the hydrogen side, must be that hydrogen ions want to be reduced more than zinc ions. As a result, we are saying that the tendency to be reduced is less for zinc than it is for hydrogen. So since the voltmeter reads 0.76, volts difference between the two, we are going to give hydrogen the value of zero and the zinc electrode and um, the zinc half cell, we're going to give it the value of negative 0.76 volts, meaning that it is less inclined to be reduced than hydrogen. Anything with a positive uh, standard reduction potential is more inclined to be reduced than hydrogen and we would see the hydrogen gas turning into H plus if we paired it up with something with a positive voltage. So according to this uh, diagram, the zinc anode is where we're gonna see oxidation occurring and uh, the standard hydrogen electro electrode is where we see reduction occurring. So we, uh, we take the voltmeter reading and it tells us the difference in reduction potential between zinc and hydrogen, and by the electron direction of flow, we determine that the zinc side is negative, so 0.76 volts. So the thermodynamically favorable direction for this is 2H plus plus zinc yields zinc plus two plus hydrogen. So the zinc electrode is actually where the oxidation is occurring the hydrogen electrode, the standard hydrogen electrode, is where the um, reduction is occurring. So we paired up the zinc half cell, the anode, with the hydro standard hydrogen electrode half cell, the cathode. The voltage of 0.76 volts tells us the difference between the two sides. And Everything, of course, is one molar, and the gas hydrogen on the, on the right side is one atmosphere. So the zinc electrode on the left, it, the zinc anode, is simply pure metal zinc, which is the standard state for zinc. For zinc. Um, on the left side, because zinc atoms are losing electrons, we would see zinc plus two dissolving into the solution. So the concentration of zinc plus two is gonna be increasing and the amount of zinc anode is gonna be decreasing. So you're actually gonna find that the zinc anode slowly dissolves into the solution. And on the other side, we are gonna see that the H plus ions concentration is gonna be decreasing and uh, the molarity of H plus on the, on the right side will be going down and the amount of H2 gas is gonna be increasing. Now this reaction actually will occur in one beaker. You can just put a piece of zinc metal in an acid and the H plus from the zinc metal 
and the or H plus from the acid and the zinc metal atoms will turn into zinc plus two and, and bubble off hydrogen gas. But it's separating them into two half cells that lets us control the electron flow through the wire connecting the two half cells. Now because zinc plus two is forming on the left, you would need some ions of the negative charge. Uh, in this case, in the salt bridge, you've got sodium chloride. You'll have some chloride ions that will flow into the, uh, the left side beaker in order to uh, balance the charges because you can't just add zinc plus twos without having negative charges in there to go with it. So chloride would flow in. On the other side, sodium ions will flow in to replace the hydrogen ions that are turning into neutral hydrogen gas. We use platinum inert electrode uh, anytime we don't have a suitable metal in the reaction for that particular side of the, um, of the galvanic cell. So the trick to finding that value of um, the voltage for the voltage is that the, um, the voltage of a standard cell, remember one that has one molar and one atmosphere and 25 Celsius, this, the galvanic cell's voltage, the battery voltage if you want to say it, is the standard reduction potential of the cathode minus the standard reduction potential of the anode. Now over on the right here we see a lot of reduction reactions. They're all written in the reduction direction, but they can be run in either direction. Um, you can run them forward as a reduction or in reverse as an oxidation. And in fact, what you're going to have is one of the reactions will run forward, and that will be the reduction reaction will be happening at the cathode. And then the oxidation reaction, where one of these reactions runs in reverse, will be happening at the anode. Now to be thermodynamically favored, we need the pairing of the cathode and the anode to give us a positive voltage. So whichever direction gives a positive voltage. So another way of looking at that is you can kind of see in this table, it's like a number line. You have zero being the standard hydrogen electrode and then all of the positive numbers are listed in order from low to high on the, on the um, uh, above and on the left side, and then the negative uh, values for standard hydrogen or standard reduction potential are listed from small to large uh, as you go down on the in the right column. So the trick is to choose a half reaction from the higher numbers to be the cathode and one from the lower numbers to be the anode. As long as, if we think of this kind of like a number line, as long as the cathode has a larger E naught, a more positive E naught um, than the anode, um, and it doesn't have to be a positive and a negative, it could be two positives, but one of them will be more positive than the other and there'll be a difference. And the difference from the cathode to the anode, from the larger voltage to the smaller voltage, larger voltage minus smaller voltage, will be a positive number. So the half reaction higher on the table runs forward reduction, while the half reaction lower on the table will be the oxidation step, and you'll simply flip it and add it to the other reaction. So this is how um, the galvanic cells work. They will always flow uh, electrons in the direction that gives them a positive voltage. Um, also, this can also help us figure out the favored direction of any redox reaction. In fact, if you look at this, you say you wanted to know a, uh, uh, a redox reaction that you could, um, uh, two, uh, two uh, half reactions you could put together and expect to get a thermodynamically favorable uh, reaction. Well, any reduction step can be paired with any oxidation step that is lower in voltage than the reduction step. So for example, F2 uh, will react with um, Cl minus. So if you notice on the, on the chart here, F2 is at 2.87.
Cl minus is down at 1.36. So 2.87 is above 1.36. In the uh, 2.87 number, F2 is a reactant, but the Cl minus is a product in the 1.36, but you wouldn't leave it as a product. You would flip the reaction, um, and you would have Cl minus turn into Cl2. So the overall reaction would be F2 plus C 2 Cl minus yields uh, 2 F minus plus Cl2. And the two electrons would cancel out on each side. And so by flipping the lower reaction and adding it to the upper reaction unflipped, you can create a combination of two half reactions that would give an overall thermodynamically favorable um, entire redox reaction. And you could also make a battery out of it. Whatever the difference in the two voltages are would be the voltage of that battery uh, if you used standard conditions. So let's look at making a galvanic cell uh, using zinc and copper. So the galvanic cell is going to use the reaction solid zinc and copper plus 2 makes copper metal plus zinc plus 2. If you put a piece of zinc in a solution of copper plus 2, you will find that the piece of zinc dissolves while the copper comes out as a red-brown solid. Um, it is a, uh, a single replacement reaction. Um, zinc goes into solution, but the copper turns back into copper metal. So in this particular case, it looks like we're adding electrons to copper plus 2 to make copper. So that's going to be the reduction side, or the cathode. And the oxidation side is going to be that the zinc metal turns into zinc plus 2, plus 2 electrons. Now, the E0 for these two reactions can be found in the table. Um, the copper plus 2 reaction is found at 0.34 volts over in the upper right. Copper plus 2 plus 2 electrons yields copper. The zinc um, elect, uh, reaction, the zinc reaction, is found at negative 0.76, but it's written as zinc plus 2 plus 2 electrons yields zinc. Now notice it's below the copper reaction, so that means we would flip it, and it would become zinc yields zinc plus 2 plus 2 electrons. So now the voltage we're going to get is the difference between 0.34 and negative 0.76, or 0.34 volts minus negative 0.76 volts. So the standard galvanic cell potential for this zinc and copper reaction would be 1.10 volts. Electrons are going to flow from the zinc anode to the copper cathode because electrons are being formed at the zinc anode as zinc is giving up electrons to become zinc plus 2 oxidation. Electrons are being used up at the copper cathode as reduction is occurring to turn copper plus 2 into copper metal. We would notice the zinc electrode um, would lose mass and dissolve. The copper electrode is actually gaining mass as copper plus 2 ions stick to the copper electrode. So it might look something like this. Maybe we put one molar zinc nitrate, uh, zinc plus two nitrate, in the left-hand uh, beaker with a zinc anode. And electrons are going to flow through the voltmeter. And the voltmeter should read 1.10 volts. And we'd have a copper cathode and copper plus two ions in solution. And then maybe some sodium nitrate in our salt bridge so that we could maintain our charge balance as electrons flow uh, from the zinc anode to the zinc cathode. Now, um, the zinc anode would lose mass. The copper cathode would gain mass over time. And uh, we have a special type of notation for this. Uh, we always start with the anode, uh, we call it the line notation. We start with the anode on the left and give its two components. And so that would be the zinc electrode and the zinc plus two ions in solution. And we put a vertical line between them. And then we use a double line to separate the anode from the cathode. 
And on the cathode side, we would write the copper plus two ion as being the um, uh, ion that's going to react in solution, and then the copper metal as being the electrode, the cathode on the right side. So that little notation can be used to describe that picture above. A zinc electrode, zinc plus two ion in solution, a copper plus two ion in solution, and a copper electrode. So let's review here galvanic cells. A complete description of galvanic cell usually includes four items. You'd want to know what the cell potential was, and it's whichever direction cathode and anode choice gives you a positive voltage. So the E naught cathode needs to be larger than the E naught anode because E naught cathode minus E naught anode will give you a positive E naught of the cell or the cell potential. Um, you also want to know what the balanced uh, cell reactions are. So you want to put the um, uh, reduction at the cathode together with the oxidation at the anode into a complete chemical equation if you're going to describe what's happening in the galvanic cell. Uh, usually you want to know what the direction of the electron flow is, and that can be determined by seeing which side of the reaction, uh, what's giving up the electrons and what's gaining uh, the electrons. Uh, the anode is where oxidation is occurring. The cathode is where reduction is occurring. So you'd want to designate those. And then you'd want to decide what would be your electrode and what are your ions present in each compartment. Remember, if you don't have a metal that's capable of being your electrode, you can always um, use a chemically inert conductor such as platinum as the electrode on that particular side. So let's do another example. Let's take a look at the example of um, silver uh, plus going to silver and Fe plus 3 going to Fe plus 2. So we've picked these two um, uh, standard reduction reactions out of the table. Uh, we, we know their E-naught values are 0 0.80 volts and 0 0.77 volts. So to get a positive number we need the silver reaction to run in the forward direction and the iron reaction to run in reverse. So we're going to say Ag plus plus Fe plus 2 yields Fe plus 3 plus silver. And no multipliers are needed because we have one electron um, being transferred. And so um, E naught of the cell is only going to be a paltry 0.03 volts. Um, but we will get some voltage, 0.03 volts, and electrons are going to flow um, because the iron plus 2 is giving up an electron to become iron plus 3. That electron would flow from the iron uh, half cell over to the silver half cell where it turns Ag plus into Ag. Uh, so we're going to have those two um, uh, reactions happening. The iron half cell is the oxidation, the silver half cell is the reduction. On the silver side, uh, the electrode is silver metal, or and the solution is one molar silver plus, but you could use maybe a platinum electrode on the iron side, and then some one molar Fe plus 2 and Fe plus 3. So then your line notation might look like what's below there. With the anode written first, because the anode is where oxidation is occurring, and then the iron is where oxidation is occurring, and then the cathode second, because that's where the silver is being reduced. So this picture, um, kind of blurry, but it kind of shows what you would expect. Um, now it's using a porous disc instead of um, a uh, um, the salt bridge in this particular case. Um, that's another option, is a porous disc like that. The driving force behind these thermodynamically favor favorable reactions that give us these uh, positive voltages is called the electromotive force, or EMF. It's given units of volts. Um, volts are going to be the work in joules divided by the quantity of charge in coulombs. So one joule of work done when one coulomb of electron 
uh, electrical charge is transferred uh, between uh, two positions in the circuit that have a difference of one volt. Now the maximum work is going to be negative QE uh, where uh, Q is the charge and E is the voltage. So if you think about it, work equals QE. Now the work is negative because we consider if the uh, cell or the um, the system is is may is is uh, creating work or doing work that's a loss of energy from the system and a battery as it as it moves electrons through a circuit will lose energy over time we know that batteries run down right so the actual harness work will actually be a little bit less this is going to be the work max remember we saw this before with uh, delta G equals work max. So since delta G equals work max, then we could say that delta G equals negative NFE, um, or delta G naught equals negative NFE naught. So N uh, being the number of coulombs, um, F being a converter that lets, um, uh, lets you uh, convert the um, the coulombs to uh, uh, moles of electrons and then E naught being the uh, voltage. Um, actually, uh, I'll take that back. N is not the number of coulombs. N is the number of electrons that are being transferred in a particular um, uh, redox reaction. Sometimes you have one electron or two electrons or so forth. So the Faraday constant is actually, uh, it's called capital F, it's the number of coulombs it takes to make a mole of electrons. It actually takes 96,485 coulombs of, of a charge to equal one mole of electrons. So let's calculate using that um, re, uh, equation. Let's calculate the delta G naught or the change in in the standard Gibbs free energy for the reaction Cu plus 2 plus Fe yields Cu plus Fe plus 2. So let's take a look at first of all the um, the reduction step would be Cu plus 2 plus Cu. So I can find that at 0.34 volts. Um, I'm looking specifically for the Fe plus 2 yields Fe reaction and I find that reaction uh, down at negative 0.44 volts. So you can see that on the table, negative 0.44 volts. If I pair those two with the copper being the reduction step and the iron being the oxidation step, running it in reverse, uh, then I can say 0.34 minus negative 0.44 would be positive 0.78 volts. That bothers me that um, supposed to be a period, not a comma. All right, there we go. Uh, 0.78 volts. Um, so now that I have the voltage E naught, I can plug into negative NF E naught. Um, I'm using a 2 here for N because there were two electrons being transferred. 96,485 um, coulombs per mole of electrons and 0.78 volts. And we find that we get negative 1.5 times 10 to the fifth joules or negative 150 kilojoules. So what we're saying here is the thermodynamically favored direction is the one that gives a positive voltage but gives a negative delta G. Um, here we've got the copper metal and the cerium plus 4 becoming copper plus 2 and cerium plus 3. Now this is being made into a... Um, uh, galvanic cell with a voltage of 1.36 volts under standard conditions. Now if we look at this um, reaction as an equilibrium, what would happen if 
under standard conditions, we have one molar CE plus four, but then if what if we go non-standard and increase it to over one molar? Well, that would be like putting in reactant, which should drive the equilibrium to the right, which should make the forward reaction more favorable, which should make the voltage higher. So the forward reaction would be even more favored than it is under standard conditions. And as a result, you would get even more work and more voltage uh, from that particular arrangement. So that would be a way of looking at non-standard conditions. Uh, if you were to increase the concentration um, of cerium plus three and copper plus two, we would find that uh, increase in concentration of those two ions would resist the forward direction, which would lower the voltage. Let's look at another example of that. We got two aluminums and three uh, manganese plus twos, making two Al plus threes and three manganeses. E naught here is 0.48 volts. So we know that's 0.48 volts if the manganese plus two is one molar and the aluminum plus three is one molar. So what if we made the aluminum plus three two molar? Well, that would be increasing the amount of product, which would shift the equilibrium to the left, which would make it less favorable in the forward direction, which would lower the voltage. I would expect E of, e of the cell to be smaller than E naught. Uh, if I instead increase the amount of manganese plus two to three molar, that would then push the uh, reaction to the right, which would increase the voltage of the, of the galvanic cell. Smaller in the first case, larger in the second case. Now, since changing concentration can change your cell potential, it is actually possible to construct a galvanic cell with both half cells constructed the same except for concentration. You can actually have silver metal and silver ion on one side and silver metal and silver ion on the other side. But if they have different concentrations, you will actually um, create a situation where there's going to be one direction that's going to be favored. Um, what you would actually see is electrons are going to flow from the side that has the lower molarity of silver plus one. Uh, the left side has 0.1 molar, the right side has one molar. So that would cause the silver um, anode to oxidize and form silver plus one ions and dissolve. Meanwhile, the silver plus one on the right side would um, uh, reduce and form silver metal and plate out onto the silver electrode on the right side as electrons are gained. So in this case, we would corrode away the silver on the left and we would form the silver on the right. And this would actually be thermodynamically favorable in the forward direction until the two molarities on the two sides became equal. The molarity of silver on the left would increase, the molarity of the silver on the right would decrease. Electrons would flow from si the side with the lower concentration of silver to the side with the higher side until the two sides had equal concentration. So now we can not only find the delta G under standard conditions, we can actually find the delta G um, under um, non-standard conditions, remember, by using delta G equals delta G naught minus, or plus rather RTL in Q. That was a chapter 17 equation for non-standard conditions. Since we know delta G is negative NFE, um, negative NFE equals negative NFE naught plus RTL in Q. Divide both sides by negative NF and you get E, the non-standard cell potential, is equal to E naught, the standard cell potential, minus RT over NF times LNQ. R is a constant. T is 298. Uh, F is the Faraday, 96,485, so we can actually just get a single number for all those. And we can also uh, get rid of that awkward natural log and replace it with log base 10 by simply uh, flipping around some math and getting that E equals E naught minus 0 0.0591 over N times log Q. Now I could not get rid of N 
because N is different for each reaction depending on how many electrons are transferred in that particular reaction. Plus log Q. All right, so uh, let's say E naught was 0.48 volts for the reaction two aluminum plus three manganese twos makes two aluminum plus threes plus three manganese. What would be the cell potential if we change the manganese plus two to 0.5 molar and the aluminum plus three to 1.5 molar? Now, I would expect the cell potential to go down because we are um, lowering the amount of reactant and increasing the amount of product. So let's take a look at how uh, the equation goes for that. E would be E naught, 0.48 volts, the standard reduction potential, or standard uh, cell potential, minus 0.0591 over 6. There's actually six electrons transferred from the three manganese plus twos to the two Al plus threes. Um, no, the other way. Six electrons transferred from the two Al's to the three manganese plus twos because the aluminum is losing electrons and oxidizing. The uh, manganese is gaining electrons and being reduced. So it's six electrons being transferred, so it'd be N would equal six. And now we're going to be, do the log of 1.50 squared over 0.50 cubed. The aluminum, the aluminum and the manganese are not included in Q because they're not aqueous. Uh, it turns out it's only a small change in the voltage. It only drops to 0.47 volts. But it is lower, and that's because uh, decreasing the amount of reactant and increasing the product concentration makes the reaction less thermodynamically favorable. So that's actually what occurs over time in a battery. In a battery, over time, the concentration of the reactant side is going to decrease and the concentration of the product side is going to increase. And so the voltage will slowly come down 0.48 volts, 0.47 volts, 0.46 volts. And eventually, uh, the galvanic cell will be drained of energy because Q will end up becoming equal to K, you'll reach an equilibrium between the reactant and the product. Once you reach an equilibrium, there's no longer any driving force. Delta G is zero, and so the voltage will be zero. And so it ties it all together. It ties equilibrium together with thermodynamics and now with electrochem. Uh, you create a system that's not at equilibrium. You let it reach equilibrium. As it's reaching equilibrium, you harness the energy from it. Um, using a galvanic cell. Once Q becomes equal to K, your battery is totally drained of energy and delta G is zero and the voltage will be zero. You can actually create electrodes that are sensitive to a particular ion and um, since you can get a voltage, like a concentration cell can uh, get a voltage depending on the concentration of the ions, it is possible to create a pair of um, uh, elect, uh, kind of an electrode that sort of pairs a, a uh, concentration of known molarity to one outside the vo uh, electrode that has um, an unknown molarity and you can actually get the molarity of the unknown solution by measuring the voltage between the reference electrode and the, um, the electrode that's, uh, uh, that's, using, that's uh, exposed to the solution outside. pH meters actually use the H plus ion concentration. It measures the H plus ion concentration as a voltage between um, the solution and the, um, the electrode. And the ion selective electrode is selective for H plus ions. And so that's actually how you can get a digital pH reading uh, from a uh, solution um, by measuring the ion concentration by a voltage difference. We can also use the Nernst equation to solve for equilibrium constants. E equals E naught minus 0.0591 over N log Q. Well, at equilibrium, E is going to be zero and so if you take that, you'll find that log K, because we convert Q to K at equilibrium, log K is going to equal N E naught 
over 0.0591. So let's say we have the reaction SO, S4O6 2 minus plus 2 Cr2 plus yields 2 Cr plus 3 plus 2 S2 O3 2 minus and we want to know what the standard reduction um, or actually the uh, standard um, galvanic cell potential is for that E naught and what the K value is for that equilibrium. Well the two half reactions are shown and their E naught values are shown. Um, if you uh, flip the uh, actually the uh, second reaction is already flipped uh, in this particular example. Um, it's already written in the oxidation direction but your two voltages from the standard reduction potential table are given as 0.17 volts and negative 0.50 volts. So when you take the um, standard uh, voltage of the ele uh, electrochemical cell, it's 0.67 volts. Uh, so log K equals, uh, there's two electrons being transferred, so N is 2, times 0.67 volts over Another misprint here, forgot the, uh, forgot the separation uh, division sign there. Okay, there, I got it fixed. Over 0 0.0591, which gives us a K equal to 10 to the 22.6, or 4 times 10 to the 22. So you can see this reaction is highly favored going to the right. And um, that's evident by the fact that you get 0.67 volts out of it. So then how do these become batteries? Uh, you don't have to just have one cell. You can actually put a series of cells together to get a higher voltage. For example, your car battery uses a reaction at the anode with lead solid becoming lead plus 2 and precipitating as lead sulfate, and at the cathode, lead oxide becoming lead plus 2, and um, that overall reaction ends up uh, giving a voltage around 2 volts. A uh, typical car battery is going to have six of those voltaic cells connected in series to make a total of 12 volts. Um, and uh, H2SO4 is going to be your electrolyte that you're going to be, um, that all of these uh, electrodes are going to be placed in. As the reaction occurs, the um, concentration of the sulfuric acid goes down and the density of the uh, uh, battery acid will decrease. And that's actually one way of sort of measuring the charge of the battery is to measure the density of the um, acid in the battery. If the density goes down too much, the battery needs to be recharged. There are also dry cell versions. Now, I'm just going to say here, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these applications. Um, AP tests will mainly be testing you on theory and math. And um, as a result, um, I do want to talk about a little bit about some of these applications of electrochemistry because there's lots of good engineering and lots of good applications, but I'm just not going to go into detail on them because I don't want to waste your time um, as you're trying to get ready for the AP test. But there are dry cells that um, use a, um, a zinc and a manganese dioxide reaction. Um, and uh, usually they, they have uh, some kind of electrolytic paste. So instead of a liquid, it's more of a paste, but there's still ability for ions to migrate um, and go to the uh, cathode, the anode. Um, the anode is where oxidation occurs and the cathode is where reduction occurs. And so you can have the dry cell acid version, which is called the Leclanche cell, or the alkaline battery that we're probably all familiar, familiar with, the Energizer, the Duracell batteries. Um, and they are actually uh, using um, uh, alkaline or basic uh, conditions in an alkaline battery. The dry cell uh, battery with the acid version uses an acidic solution instead of a basic solution, but very similar. 
um, and uh, you're using a pair of um, a reduction reaction paired with an oxidation reaction to get a voltage um, out of these. Usually they give you 1.5 volts. So if you want a 9 volt battery, you actually put six 1.5 volt cells in series. There are other kinds of redox reactions that are used to make batteries. Uh, there's ones involving silver, so there's some like some little button batteries that, that claim there's no mercury in them. Those are the ones that, that are using a silver reaction. Uh, there are some button batteries that use mercury, um, so they're not quite as good for the environment or, you know, give the danger of poisoning if they corrode or, um, or a leak. So uh, you have these mercury batteries that use a zinc and mercury oxide reaction. And then you have the lithium ion batteries, uh, the lithium um, ions transferring between the anode and the cathode. Uh, the lithium is a, uh, a popular choice because of its light weight. Think about the light, uh, you know, mercury and silver, those are heavy metals. Lithium is a lightweight metal. And so for carrying around in your um, uh, cell phone or uh, using in a drill or um, maybe even a Prius, uh, some type of electric car, lithium uh, ion batteries are a popular choice because they're lightweight. Um, a similar to a battery is something called a fuel cell. Um, and uh, fuel cells also do electrochemical reactions to produce electric current as well. So here's a diagram of a hydrogen and oxygen fuel cell. So um, although these are not uh, commonly used in everyday life, um, batteries are preferred. Uh, fuel cells have been used, for example, in space travel um, and some of the high-tech applications like that. Uh, if you remember the Apollo 13 uh, movie, um, in, in actuality, it was the hydrogen tank and the oxygen tank that was supposed to be generating the electricity um, that, that had an explosion, um, uh, then that's what uh, messed up the Apollo 13 mission. Uh, luckily, they were able to get everybody back uh, safely, but they were not able to land on the moon because of a, a uh, uh, explosion in a hydrogen and oxygen tank. And um, they, uh, they were using that hydrogen oxygen to generate electricity uh, by a fuel cell. So um, uh, redox reactions are not all um, uh, these reactions that we uh, are, are happy to see happen because they give us battery power. Um, corrosion is another example of the thermodynamically favorable oxidation of, of metals. Um, for example, here we see what's happening at the anode and the cathode um, as a drop of water is uh, forming um, and oxygen from the air is forming rust on a surface of iron. Um, so iron tends to rust when it gets wet and when it's exposed to the air and the oxygen in the air as the iron solid and the oxygen gas are becoming um, iron uh, oxide. And so this is actually um, occurring in a similar way to what would happen in a galvanic cell. It's a thermodynamically favorable reaction. The metal wants to oxidize um, and as a result, the metal uh, corrodes away and turns into rust. There are ways to prevent this. One way is by coating steel with zinc, because zinc actually rusts uh, easier than um, iron does. But unlike iron, where the, uh, the rust tends to uh, dissolve away or flake off and expose the unreacted um, uh, iron underneath to more reaction. Um, typically, if you um, if you have zinc covering your iron, um, the zinc will corrode and turn white. But then that patina, that white colored coating, will actually be fairly strong and stick to um, the surface of the iron and tend to block airflow and water flow to the iron underneath. And so we call this galvanized steel. 
So if you have um, some nails that are galvanized, it means they're coated with zinc to try to protect the uh, steel in the uh, or the iron metal in the in the nail from corrosion. Often it's done with uh, metal roofing. They'll they'll put zinc on it. Uh, since um, a metal may have a higher tendency to corrode than iron, it is actually possible to um, sacrificially uh, corrode one metal to keep iron, which is in contact with water and um, uh, and tending and tending to rust. You could actually prolong the life of, say, a steel pipe underground using a sacrificial anode such as a piece of magnesium. Given a choice, magnesium um, uh, oxidizes before iron does. And so by putting a chunk of magnesium in the ground with an electric uh, wire between it and the iron, you can actually uh, save the iron from rusting by sacrificing the rusting of the magnesium. This is called cathodic protection. Uh, they actually use them in um, hot water heaters because they're steel in your hot water heater and it's going to tend to, to rust except uh, if you use a um, anti-corrosion rod um, like magnesium as a sacrificial anode the rod will corrode before the iron inside the tank corrodes um, so typically what happens eventually that uh, magnesium corrodes away and then your um, your hot water heater is going to be um, uh, uh, rusting on you and, and eventually rust out. Uh, it is possible for the homeowner um, or a plumber to replace that sacrificial anode rod and that will prolong the life of the electric water heater. Okay. Thank you for hanging in there. We are now back to some theoretical and mathematical stuff. Uh, we've been talking a lot about galvanic cells and how they occur in the thermodynamically favored direction and you're able to harness the energy from them. But what if you don't want the reaction to occur in that direction, you want it to occur in the opposite direction? Well, we saw back in chapter 17 that if you input energy into a system, you can get the reaction to flow in the opposite direction. So if you do that in such a way as you actually apply a voltage, instead of harnessing a voltage from a, from a galvanic cell, you apply a voltage that opposes the natural voltage of a galvanic cell. You oppose it with an outside voltage, like a battery or something, or um, some wires that are hooked up to some electrical source. You can create what is called an electrolytic cell. An electrolytic cell is one that runs in the reverse direction from what is thermodynamically favorable. And that might be what you want to do to get some reactions to occur in your um, electrochemical cell. So both of these would be considered electrochemical cells. Um, now if you remember as a galvanic cell uh, you would be getting a voltage by letting zinc um, uh, lose electrons and dissolve and give the electrons to copper plus two and turn into copper metal. That is chemical energy becoming electrical energy and the standard reduction potential if you recall was 1.10 volts. By opposing that reaction you could actually get instead of the copper um, to uh, um, dissolve I'm sorry, the other side, uh, copper is turning into copper metal, um, you can actually get the reaction to run the other direction. Now, uh, this right side picture is not that same reaction. This is a picture with some copper 2 chloride. Uh, if you put copper metal with chlorine gas, you get copper plus 2 and Cl minus. But it's actually possible to turn copper plus 2 and Cl minus back into copper metal and Cl minus by using an outside voltage. So that's going to force the reaction in the opposite direction of its thermodynamic favorability and you're going to take electrical energy and turn it into chemical energy. 
Now, even in electrolytic cell, we still call the side where oxidation is occurring the anode and the side where reduction is occurring the cathode. So um, the cathode is always the side, whether it's a galvanic cell or an electrolytic cell where reduction is occurring. The anode is always the side where oxidation is occurring. Electrolysis actually gives us a chance to do some cool, um, some electrical stoichiometry, we're going to call it. Um, by knowing the current flow in an electrolysis setup, the current flow is going to be measured in amperes or amps. An ampere is the number of coulombs that flow through a system per second. So you can take the current in amperes as the coulombs per second, multiply by the number of seconds and get the quantity of charge in coulombs. Then you can change that charge to moles of electrons using the Faraday constant, 96,485. And then from the moles of electrons, you can figure out by how many moles of electrons give you how many moles of chemical you can actually calculate the moles of chemical that will be oxidized or reduced and then using atomic weight or formula weight you can turn it into the grams of the substance that is oxidized or reduced. So an example of this would be let's say I'm using electrolysis to plate copper onto a metal. So I have a copper anode which is going to be corroding away to make copper plus two and then the copper plus two is going to plate onto some other metal on the left side where the which is the reduct um, where the reduction is occurring and that is called the cathode so let's say I have this setup that I have on the right here with the copper anode and some metal as my cathode and I've hooked them up to the battery with the correct orientation on the battery to create a voltage that's going to be greater than the voltage that the thermodynamic favorability direction has and so it's going to run it in the opposite direction of what is thermodynamically favorable and we're going to get copper metal to plate out onto the um, metal electrode on the uh, the metal cathode so normally ca uh, copper would be the cathode but in this case it's going to be the anode so we have this set up and we run 10 amps of current through it for 30 minutes and we want to know how much mass of copper we're going to plate onto that piece of metal on the left side. So here would be the math. We would start with 10 amps, 10 amperes, which is 10 coulombs per second. And then I would multiply by 60 seconds per minute to get me coulombs per minute. And then I would multiply by 30 minutes to get me the coulombs. Then I would divide by 96,485 to convert the coulombs to moles of electrons. And then I would recognize that it takes two moles of electrons to get me one mole of copper. So now I have moles of copper. And then I would multiply by 63.55 grams of copper per mole to get the grams of copper. And it would turn out to be 5.94 grams. So examples of electrolysis, you can um, electrolyze water. Uh, at the anode, you can, use, you can do the reaction where two waters form O2 plus H plus. And at the cathode, you can have four waters making uh, two H2s plus four OH minuses, which when you put the net reaction together is um, six waters yield two hydrogen plus O2 plus four OH minuses and four H pluses which if you think about that, that's actually just four waters. So it really kind of simplifies down into two waters makes two hydrogen plus oxygen. Now that is actually the unfavorable direction. If you think about it, two hydrogens and one oxygen should burn to make two waters. That's a thermodynamically favorable direction. This has an E naught that's negative, 2.06 volts, not the positive voltage you'd expect out of a um, thermodynamically favored direction. So we're going to have um, one molar hydrogen on the anode side and one molar hydroxide on the cathode side. And that means that the outside battery supply that's going to make this reaction occur is going to have to be at least 2.06 volts. That will have to be uh, oriented in a direction that will oppose 
the um, the 2.06 volts that the natural direction of this reaction wants to have. Uh, you would have platinum electrodes here because none of these ions or molecules are a suitable um, electrode. And um, you would make oxygen gas on one side on the anode side and you would make hydrogen gas on the cathode side. Uh, you could try this with pure water but it won't work because you need an electrolyte. You need something in there usually well the uh, example used here is dilute sulfuric acid is used to allow electrons to continue to flow um, through the system and allow the reaction to occur. This particular setup which lets you pour acid in and then turn on the battery supply and generate oxygen and hydrogen gas because um, who doesn't want some oxygen and hydrogen gas out of water, right? It's called the Hoffman apparatus. Uh, let's say that we decided to try to electrolyze a mixture of ions, some silver plus one, some copper plus two, and some zinc plus two. And I wanted to know that if I slowly turned up the voltage, which ions would um, plate out first? Well, the ones that played out first are the ones that are more easily um, reduced. Or in other words, that have the ones that have the higher standard reduction potential, the higher potential to be reduced. So in the case of silver plus one, copper plus two, and zinc plus two, it would actually be the silver that would play it out first because it has the higher E naught. The copper plus two would plate second, and then the zinc plus two would plate third. Um, now, just to qualify this, because the Zumdahl textbook points this out, uh, certain combinations may not perfectly match the order in which the theory says they will, because due to the ease of which uh, certain ions can be um, oxidized or reduced, there's something that sometimes happens called overvoltage, where... Um, the um, E naught looks like it ought to be this much, but it actually has to be greater than that before um, it'll actually plate out or uh, perform the reaction you're looking to do. Now, looking again, once again, i um, not going to talk a lot about application, but I will mention a few examples. Uh, one is aluminum production. Back in the early 1800s, aluminum was considered a precious metal. Now it's used to make beer cans. And so um, uh, how did that happen? Well, it turned out that we, we found a way to electrically produce uh, aluminum by a uh, electrolytic process. Uh, it's called the hall Hero process. The American, the Hero was a Frenchman. The American that discovered this process was a young man by the name of Charles Hall. He was in engineering school at Oberlin College and was told by his professor that if you could ever figure out a way to make aluminum cheaply, you'd become rich. And so he quit school, and in a shed out behind his parents' house, he figured out a way to make aluminum cheaply. And it's by passing electricity through molten cryolite, um, you're able to produce the um, uh, cryolite being a fairly cheap ore, um, and uh, you're able to produce aluminum metal from um, molten um, uh, ionic compounds. And so the overall reaction is aluminum oxide forming aluminum and giving off carbon dioxide gas. And so chemically, this process turned out to be uh, uh, quite a boon for the production of aluminum. And um, aluminum is now used a lot because it's, it's strong and lightweight and uh, fairly corrosion resistant. Now, it turns out that aluminum production uses about 3% of the world's electricity production. So there's a lot of electricity that's used in this process. And that's where the main cost is because aluminum ore is cheap. There's lots of aluminum ore out, out there. Um, aluminum is, is common in the Earth's crust. So it's not hard to find aluminum. That's not where why aluminum is a precious metal. It's, be, it's the difficulty in turning aluminum plus 3 to aluminum uh, neutral to make it a metal, uh, but it can be done using electrolytic processes. 
Electrolytic processes can be used to electro-refine metals. So let's say you've got a, an impure anode which dissolves away, but you have a pure cathode where you're plating out the, the metal. So that would be a way of electro-refining the metal. You could take a uh, metal that's got a lot of impure impurities and other metals alloyed into it, and by passing electricity, through an electrolytic uh, cell, you can uh, generate the pure metal by plating it out. Uh, maybe you just want to plate a certain metal onto a different metal. Let's say you have an iron spoon and you want to coat it with silver to have electroplated silver on your silverware. Uh, that's possible using a battery and a, an electrode of silver. Uh, the silver electrode is the anode and it dissolves into silver plus and the spoon is the cathode and that's where the silver plus one ions are going to um, plate out onto the iron spoon. Uh, sodium metal is actually produced not from a sodium chloride solution. You might think well, all I have to do is pass electricity through sodium chloride and I can get some chlorine gas and some sodium metal. Well, you will get the chlorine gas, but the sodium metal will react with the water and produce sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So if you pass electricity through uh, salt water, you actually get hydrogen gas and chlorine gas, not sodium metal and chlorine gas. However, if you melt the sodium chloride and pass electricity through it, you can get the sodium metal and the chlorine gas at your two electrodes. And of course, the other one is the production of hydrogen and oxygen. So it is as simple as using electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen that you can produce pure hydrogen gas. And then if you have a car that burns on hydrogen gas, you can basically um, store the energy from the electricity as hydrogen gas and then burn it in a car engine, kind of like you would another kind of uh, flammable gas like gasoline. Um, so what you're doing there is you're creating a car that runs on hydrogen but then the hydrogen is produced by the use of electricity. Okay, so we have finished chapter 18, and um, here are the homework questions that you need to do for chapter 18. So I will be posting this video soon.